Jesus wounds sin requires consolation he would bring our praise to Christ our King in our hearts we find the blessed Good morning, SCC. We hope you had a great 4th of July. That you have all your fingers. Would you sing with us? Ruined, wretched, we are dire. Jesus' wounds, sin required. A consolation he would bring all praise to Christ our King. In our hearts we find neglect, pleading love we did reject. Hopeless in our flesh we sing, all praise to Christ our King. Oh, great grace, salvation, the song of the redeemed, hallelujah, our Savior, in Jesus we believe. In this world of sin and woe, chase pursue by cast out foe. Evil's lie no longer stings. All praise to Christ our King. Oh, great, great salvation, the song of the redeemed. Hallelujah, our Savior, in Jesus we Victorious we will sing Oh great, great salvation Our praise to Christ our King By the Spirit, come be born again. Life anew, a second birth, come be born again. Eyes to see the kingdom of God.
Well, good morning again. Welcome to Snohomish Community Church Online. Hey, for all the kids out there, we've got VBS coming up. We're really excited. There's a whole bunch of families already set up to host, and this is a, a little video about what that's going to be like. Take a look. We are so excited to announce that Bolt VBS is coming to your house July 14th through the 16th with minimal preparation, easy to follow instructions, and a video that leads your family step-by-step step through each day, Bolt is designed to bring the fun and faith formation of VBS to your home. Each day, kids will play games, a lot. <laughs> so create fun crafts. Now a second corner fold to center. Look at that precision. And worship with Citizen Way and hear stories from the gospel. I got my armor now, no fear, no doubt, can't shoot me down, no. We are looking for host families to invite their life group, neighborhood kids, along with family and friends over for a backyard VBS adventure. And now, for those of you watching at home, it's your turn to play. All you need to do is invite some friends over to join you July 14th through 16th for Bolt VBS. Register your whole group online at wearescc.org slash events and pick up your VBS kit on July 9th at the church. We'll have your supplies and your t-shirts packed and ready for you. And if you have any updates or changes to your group, just let us know at vbs at wearescc.org. Thanks, and we hope you'll join us this summer as we bolt our way into a stronger faith in Jesus. From Psalm 119, verses 65 through 72, as we continue in worship, Psalmist says this, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. And then he goes on to explain what this dealing well with him means. So pay attention. He says, Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Listen to that again. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Amen. When was the last time that you said, it is good for me that I was afflicted? Probably not very often. And yet, here we have the psalmist who is saying that. He's saying, before he was afflicted, he went astray. But it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. That was the result of his affliction. Now, I encourage you today, for whatever affliction you may be experiencing, to put your trust in the Lord and to look for the good that he is going to do in your life through it. That through your affliction, you will learn of God. You will learn of his ways. And I love how he ends here. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Know, see that the greatest treasure that you could ever obtain is the work of God in your life is his word in your life and knowing, knowing him. So today, praise him. No matter what affliction you're facing, praise him. Join with the heavens and the earth in glorifying our great God. He is good to us, even in the midst of difficult times. the Lord, ye heavens adore him. And praise him, angels in the height. Sun and moon rejoice before him. And praise him, all ye stars of light. And praise the Lord, for he hath spoken. 
worlds his mighty voice obeyed and laws which never shall be broken for their guidance he hath made all creation join the song of praise let every tongue declare his mighty We'll sing of your goodness and mercy all of our days. Praise the Lord, for he is glorious. Never shall his promise fail. God hath made his saints victorious. not prevail. All creation join the song of praise. Let every tongue declare His mighty ways. We will sing of Your goodness and mercy. Mercy all of our days. 
are here moving in our midst I worship you I worship you you are here working in this place I worship you I worship you you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are you are here touching every heart I worship you I worship you you are here and healing every life I worship you I worship you you are here and turning lives around I worship you I worship you you are here bending every heart I worship you I worship you you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is darkness my god that is who you are 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 Lord Jesus, thank you that the promises of who you are are true for us today. They are an amen, so we say amen. You are, you are the way, the truth, the life. And Lord Jesus, you're with us now. You transcend all time and space and are above it all. 
And so we can rest in your hand and in the knowledge of your infinite wisdom. You've been so good to us through the cross, through your love and care for each one of us, God, as you as you guide us, as you provide for us. And so we give you thanks and we worship you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Uh, the chairman of our elder board, Bruce, is here this morning to uh, share with us and, and to pray for us and our country as we celebrate Independence Day. Bruce. Thank you, Luke. Hello, everyone, and happy 4th of July weekend to you. I hope you're having a good one. This is the time in our calendar when we celebrate Independence Day for the United States, and I must admit it's been one of my favorite holidays through the years with sweet, sweet memories of crowding on Main Street to watch the parade go down the street and the marching bands, the many community picnics for the family and all the families in our town that we grew up in, the wonderful patriotic music that uh, just sticks in your mind even after it's, the concert is over, and of course the fireworks, the spectacular fireworks. What a fun time Fourth of July celebrations have been in the past. And now if you fast forward to 2020, it's a bit of a different scene this year. With a worldwide COVID pandemic and all the CDC protocols, the economic downturns and millions of lost jobs, with a government that is divisive, divided, contentious, with lots of issues for families to deal with. It's a very different scene. We'll make memories this year for sure, but they'll be of a different sort. So we are in a broken and troubled world without a doubt. And we ask, well, what are we to do as the family of God? And I ran across a verse in my reading of scripture this morning in Colossians 4, which says we are to devote ourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful. So let's do just that right now. Would you please join me in a word of prayer as we lift up our, our country, our leaders, and the families that are dealing with today. Heavenly Father, we worship and adore you. We lay our lives before you, Almighty God, Holy One. Lord, we praise you and we exalt you. Even though we live in a troubled world, Lord, we live with hope and great assurance because we know, Lord, that you are sovereign over all things. You are full of compassion and grace. And, Father, for that we are so ever thankful. Lord, we know that as we pray for peace and unity in our country, we are called to be your instruments of peace and light and hope to those around us. Father, from the old, I love the verse from the old hymn that says, Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. Lord, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for serving thee whom we adore. Father, we lift up our leaders in our country, especially those in Washington, D.C., our president and vice president, and the other leaders in Congress, for those in the CDC, Father, we pray that you would give them wisdom and courage to do what is right in your sight. We lift up those in Olympia, our governor and other leaders that are making decisions that affect us all. We lift up the leaders here in Snohomish County and in our town. Father, we pray that your spirit would minister to their hearts that they might do what God's word says in Micah 6, 8, that they should act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Father, we pray for peace and unity and for revival, a mighty moving of your spirit across this land. Father, we just pray, Lord, that your spirit would would in, in, in just would work through us 
individually and as a, as a body of Christ to affect our community and beyond. Father, we pray for our pastors and our staff. We give thanks for each one of them and for the faithful shepherding and ministering to our flock, preaching the word of truth. We're so thankful for this timely sermon series on Psalms that ministers to our spirit each week. Lord, we pray that you'd watch over them and their families. Father, we lift up the law enforcement officers and the medical staffs and the first responders who have placed themselves in jeopardy and at risk in order to help others at this time. Father, we pray for all our families. We pray for their safety and their health. And together as a body of Christ, we pray that we will be faithful ambassadors to impact the world for Jesus today and in the days ahead. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us today and always. And to God be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now Pastor Gordon would like to give us a video update on our, one of our refugee families. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. There's something we'd like you to join us in praying for. Last August, SCC partnered again with World Relief to help resettle another immigrant family. And so we created another good neighbor team to work with Wahid and Zura Nuri and their four children from Afghanistan. Our team grew to love this family and helped them do everything from starting bank accounts, to housing, to medical appointments, getting their kids in school, and just being friends in Christ's name. They've actually been to our church a couple of times. Adjusting to life here in the United States wasn't easy, but Wahid and Zura worked hard at it. Both found jobs and the kids were adjusting well. But now here's the hard news. On Father's Day at a family outing by the Snoqualmie River, Wahid, the father, slipped and fell in. Rescue efforts failed. His body was found two days later. As you can imagine, the family is devastated and we're heartbroken with them. You may even have seen the story on the news. The whole Seattle region has responded to a GoFundMe that was set up. Our good neighbor team is ministering to them personally. We just wanted you to know so that you could pray. Deuteronomy 10 says the Lord defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. The book of James says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to look after widows and orphans in their distress. Please pray for Zura and the children. Pray for the good neighbor team as they minister to them and help in Christ's name. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate you so much. Thanks for praying with us. And would you pray with me for this dear family? Our gracious Heavenly Father, this is a very tender thing. This is a heart-cracking thing. Here is this family working hard to learn how to live in a new country with different customs, trying to navigate uh, all of the details of American life. And now they have to navigate it without the husband in the home. They navigate without dad in the home. Father, we pray that you would tenderly hold this family. We're so grateful that you have already given us access into their lives to be able to love and support them. We're amazed at the generous outpouring throughout the greater community with the GoFundMe campaign and the other people that are helping. So, Father, we ask for you to undertake in your mercy and with your power. And may we, with our team members from this church that are loving this family, may we be the fragrance of Jesus Christ to them. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. I really made my parents wonder about me when I was a little kid. One time I, was, uh, I decided that uh, I would take a plank of wood, prop it against the porch, and make a slide for my little sister and I to slide down. 
It wasn't slippery enough, so I found a can of green paint, painted the painted the plank with, uh, with the paint, which made it very slippery indeed. It was very effective. However, my sister and I were both wearing brand new Oshkosh overalls. And then there was the time my little sister finally grew a full head of hair, and I, I took it upon myself to crawl under the dining room table with her and give her her first haircut. I didn't get punished for these things, but I was compelled to remember. My mom pulled these memories off the shelf regularly. They became favorite bits of the family lore. Now, there were more stories I could get into, like the incident of the pencil tent stakes, the debacle of the BB gun accident, the mystery of the trumpet dents. But don't get me going. <laughs> these are stories for another time. But these stories that I do remember that my mother made sure I remembered, they're like that song, Memories Pressed Between the Pages of My Mind. God also likes to pull things off of the memory shelf. The Bible is a book full of memories, full of, full of encouragements, even commands for us to be constantly remembering. We have memories pressed between the pages of the Word of God. The word remember, if you check it in a Bible search, uh, will give you 166 hits. Our psalm today, in Psalm 40, is about remembering. It's about remembering big God things, about remembering little God things, about amazing national scale miracles, about intimate personal answers to prayer for individual sufferers. It's all a wonder. A personal God who loves and cares for his people. So, this morning as we, uh, as we get into Psalm 40, I want to invite you to join me in rediscovering the wonder. Our wonder map is here, Psalm 40. Let me, let me read it with you. This is a Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed or happy is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. Now, just before we get into verse 5. Let me say here in this fifth verse, we're going to get to uh, the fulcrum of this psalm, the very heart of it. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told." Let me just say, that fifth verse reminds us that we serve a wonder-working God. That's what makes us rejoice and sing about Him in verses 3 and 16 of this psalm. That's why we delight to serve Him in verse 8. That's why we brag on God to our friends in verses 9 and 10. That's why we have the confidence to pray to God for deliverance and help in verse 13. Continuing our reading, verse 6, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I desire to do your will, O oh my God, your law is within my heart. I've told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation, David continues, Behold, I have not restrained my lips. As you know, O Lord, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. 
For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who desire my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. Our big idea in this psalm is never forget. So since we're not supposed to forget, let's talk about three memory aids. Memory aid number one, get into history. Get into mud history, first of all. Verse 2 says, up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. Dr. Lucy Adelsberger was one of the few Jews who survived Auschwitz. In the two years she was there, only 1% of the prisoners survived. For those who survived, life on the outside could never be the same. She writes, we can't take seriously many of the things that burden our neighbors because we constantly compare and remember how everything we once yearned for and fought for was wiped out with one stroke of a pen. Because Lucy remembered the mud, for her the glories of freedom were almost unbearably wonderful. Likewise, David remembered in this psalm the mud the mud in his past in very literal terms. Verse 2, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. Nobody knows what this experience was. But to use our lingo, David was in the pits. It was a messy, mud hole experience. You know, to really appreciate deliverance, you need to remember when you were in trouble. You need to remember the mud. You know, sometimes people ask me how I am, and I might say something like, oh, so-so, or could be worse, or fair to Midland, but, but what am I comparing to? If I'm upset, am I, am I bummed out because my transmission needs to be rebuilt? Well, what about people that don't have shoes? If I just got out of Auschwitz like, like Lucy, I'd be singing the Hallelujah Chorus and couldn't care less about transmissions. If I just crawled out, crawled out of the mud pit with David, I'd be leaping for joy, regardless of the, the silly inconveniences of daily life here in America. One thing that I do that is healthy for me is to sometimes just ask myself, what would my life be now without Christ. I just try to imagine, what would it be like without Christ? Would I still be committed to my wife, or would I be divorced? Would my kids be fouled up? Might I be an alcoholic? Would I have any real friends? Would I be terrified of death? Would I have any compelling reason to get up in the morning? Would I cheat on my income tax? Would I have any peace of mind? Would I know anything about real joy? And then that causes me to realize how different my life probably would be without Christ. How I would probably be like David in a mud pit. Because I realize that God pulled me out of the biggest mud hole of all. God took me into his family. He gave me the gift of salvation. He saved me from hell. Hallelujah. I have been delivered. And besides that great, great deliverance in the gift of salvation, God has saved every one of us from a whole healthy collection of smaller mud hole experiences. By the way, I am so grateful for the mud holes of my life. They have pushed me to depend on God. They have humbled me. They have showed me the mercy of God. 
I mean, after all, what would any story be without some antagonist or crisis? What would the Lord of the Rings be without Saruman? What would Narnia be without the wicked white witch? Rich, what, which, what would Peter Rabbit be without Farmer Brown? Who would care about the story of the three little pigs without the big bad wolf? We need to remember our mud because the end of the story becomes even more glorious because it's in the mud and the deliverance of it where God gets really real to you. You know, in my life, I remember the mud hole of a dead end in Bellingham, depression in Salem, bewilderment, in five different occasions in my, in my 50s, the heartbreak of a broken relationship, you got to remember the mud. Now, from the mud, we got to get into the rock history, and David does that here. He says, he drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog. Look at the next phrase. He set my feet upon a rock. We need to get into the mud history so that we can really appreciate the rock history. He set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Lucy again, May of 1945, right after the liberation of the Allies, she walked out of the gates of the camp. Her own words, if I were to describe how we strolled through the beechwood forest during those early days of May, uninhibited and unguarded, and how we gazed through the tops of the birch trees to the heavens beyond, the heavens we could once again call our own, or how I stood in front of a blooming Japanese cherry tree and stroked the forsythia bushes with hands unshackled and wandered through meadows bounded not by wires, but only by the horizon alone, free, and yet connected to the wide world. If I were to describe all that, I'd have to be a poet. The heavens had opened. First comes our cry to God. Verse 13. Deliver me, O Lord. Help me, O Lord. Make haste. Then comes the answer. Verse 1, he heard my cry. Verse 2, he set my feet upon a rock. The metaphor of God as our rock is widespread through the Scriptures. It appears first in Genesis 49, 20, uh, 24, where Joseph's deliverance is credited to God. Quote, the rock of Israel. It's pictured in Numbers 28 when God told Moses to speak to the rock before your eyes and it will pour out its water. 1 Corinthians 10.4 tells us that that water came out of the, that, that came out of the rock for the thirsty Israelites. That was actually the provision of Jesus. It says they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. It's prominent in the song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32. Five times Moses calls God the rock. He is the rock who is perfect, who is Savior, who is Father, who is unparalleled. And I love verse 31. Speaking of the surrounding pagan nations, their rock is not like our rock as even our enemies concede. The metaphor of God the rock leaps out in the Psalms, used of God 21 times. Here in Psalm 40, David is using the rock metaphor to address actual deliverance from real-life problems. God solving those problems, getting us out of the mud, putting us in a firm stance of His provision. He is the rock, and He puts our feet on the rock. This is the special joy of seeing God answer prayer and bring us through a serious problem to a place of safety. That's what this psalm is about. From danger to safety. From peril to security. It's about a God who really answers prayer and does things for us to meet our desperate needs. Moving up numbers of centuries, we come to an 18th century man, John Newton, a more recent man who celebrated the rock. He was the author of Amazing Grace. He had a godly mother that taught him about Christ, but she died when he was seven, and he soon rejected everything she'd taught him about God. He went to sea and eventually became the captain of a slave trading ship. 
And he became such a drunkard and, and such a depraved man that once when he fell overboard, they didn't throw him a rope. They threw a harpoon into him and drug him back into the ship, wounding him so that he would limp the rest of his life. For two years, he lived hungry and destitute as, as a slave himself of a slave trader's wife. But eventually, the great fisherman of souls caught John and pulled him onto the rock. From slave trader, he became the sailor preacher of London and ultimately helped to eradicate the evil of slavery from the British Empire. So full of joy was this man that he wrote hundreds of hymns, and the best one, the best known one, is Amazing Grace. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. Friends, David here talks about the mud, and then he celebrates getting on the rock. He remembers it. He shares his memory with us. So our first memory aid is we need to get into history. We need to humbly remember our mud experiences. We need to thankfully celebrate our rock experiences. He, he drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bug. He set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Second memory eight, to never forget, get into counting. <clears throat> Look at verse five. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. See the word multiply? David's doing spiritual math here. When I was a kid uh, in our youth group, uh, we used to sing an old counting song. <clears throat> we would sing, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. And then here's the chorus. <clears throat> count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Friends, we need to count the wonders for God. By that I mean as we count our wonders, we need to tell God about his wonders. God loves for us to tell him about the wonders he has done. <clears throat> Not just to say, thank you, Lord, but to say, God, you are so wonderful. Let me, let me lay out before you, God. Let me tell you, God, what you have done. David does that in verse 5. He's talking to God. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. God knows that. God doesn't need David to tell him what he has done. But God loves to hear his people do the math and count what he has done. And we'll be surprised how many exhibits they are. Verse 5 continues and says, I will proclaim and tell of them that th yet they are more than can be told. You see, somebody's counting. Every so often it's good for my soul to write down a list under the heading, things God has done for me, and tell God. Thank you, and tell God, let me share the list with you. It pleases God. I'm talking about creating sort of a museum of the wonders of God. I've got one of those in my home. I've got a box of rock, and wonders of God, things he's done for me, are written on all these rocks. I can pull a rock out and remember one of the wonders of God in my life. And I put things in there like uh, people God has let me lead to salvation, people that God has allowed me to encourage, answers to very specific prayers, experiences of deliverance in my own life. Now, there could be a problem. If you say, I'm going to start a museum of the wonders of God in my life, 
You might scratch your head and say, I'm having a trouble thinking of anything to put in my spiritual museum. Now, if that's true, it might be because you're not trying hard enough in your Christian life. Let me just make a suggestion. You might be playing it too safe in your Christian life. Here's what I mean. If Israel had not tried to conquer Canaan, the walls of Jericho would never have fallen down. David could have stayed in the family sheep business and there would have been no story of David and Goliath. Peter would never have walked on water if he hadn't asked Jesus to call him out and if he hadn't crawled out of the boat. What I'm saying is, in our Christian lives, it is a good and healthy thing for us to push into the wonder territory of God by scaring ourselves, by taking a flyer for God and doing something risky. For me, the most scary thing I ever did for God uh, was stepping out to become a church planter in this church back in, back in uh, 92 and 93 and the years that followed. It was the scariest thing I'd ever done in my life. I prayed through those 14 years more than I'd ever prayed before. And I saw wonders of God and answers to prayer like I'd never seen before. Sometime after we, we planted the church and things were growing and going well, I was asked to address a, a breakout session for a bunch of pastors to tell the story of planting Snohomish Community Church. You want to know the title I gave to that breakout? Running Scared. <laughs> I took a flyer for God, and so did other people on the team. And it was one of the best things we ever did. We risked for God. We got stories. We got wonders. We were able to count and make lists and say, God, look what you have done. This is your church. You love it. You have supported it. We don't want to be like this guy. There was a very cautious man who never laughed or played. He never risked. He never tried. He never sang or prayed. And when he one day passed away, his insurance was denied. For since he never really lived, they claimed he never died. <laughs> we want to count the wonders for God. We want to talk to God and say, God, here's a list of the things you have done for me. It gives him pleasure. Secondly, we want to count the wonders of God for ourselves. Psalm 103 Verse 2 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. When I pray, I spend a lot more time asking God for things than I do thanking him for the things he's already done. That's not a good habit. I'm working harder these days to remember what God has already done. David does this here. He's talking about several very specific problems in his life that he's trusting God for. And he is thanking God in advance for his deliverance. So on the one hand in the psalm, David is, is crying out and presenting needs. But in other portions of the psalm, he's saying the answer is already there. David is addressing two big categories. First of all, and this is something we can all identify with, he is overcome by his own crushing guilt. Verse 12, evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me. Did you hear that? My iniquities have overtaken me. I cannot see. They, that is his iniquities, are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. David realized his first problem was he's a sinner. Derek Kidner says, whatever had been the miry bog of verse 2, the present troubles are largely of David's own making, which are catching up with him now. He says he's being overtaken by his iniquities. Hey, Christian, do you realize what a sinner you are? Are you grieved and humbled by how much God has and is forgiving you. Martin Luther, back in the Reformation, used a Latin phrase, simul justus et peccator. Translated means simultaneously righteous and sinner. Luther said, when the devil tells me I'm a sinner, he does me a favor because Jesus died for sinners. 
So at the same time, I'm a sinner and I'm a saint. We need to make sure we don't pretend that we're so holy that we don't have anything to confess, Christians. We need to remember what sinners we are. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Every once in a while I tell my friends, if I could kick the person that gives me the most trouble, I couldn't sit down for a week. So David's own sin is a huge problem. God has a solution for that. It's a wonder of forgiveness. But he's got another category he's concerned about. He's got enemies. Verse 14, let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. He's got people that want to kill him. Who are they? Uh, we don't know. Joab, Absalom, Ahithophel, Abner, Ishbosheth. Take your pick, add to the list. David, like any leader, had plenty of en enemies. And for his enemies, as well as for his sin, God answers, God forgives, God delivers. And we're supposed to make a list of these blessings that God gives to us. We're supposed to keep counting. Here's a wise word from Charles Spurgeon. As a general principle, if we would exercise our memories more wisely, we might in our very darkest distress, strike a match that would instantly kindle the lamp of comfort. There is no need for God to create a new thing upon the earth in order to restore believers' joy. If they would prayerfully rake the ashes of the past, they would find light for the present. Let us then remember the loving kindness of the Lord and rehearse His deeds of grace let us open the volume of recollection, which is so richly illuminated with, with memories of his mercy, and we will soon be happy. Thus, memory may be, as Coleridge calls it, the bosom spring of joy, and when the divine comforter bends it to his service, it is then the greatest earthly comfort we can know." Again and again, the people of God are warned about the peril of forgetting. We are exhorted to remember God's leading, God's deliverance, God's miracles, God's salvation. We're supposed to remember the cleansing from our past sins. We've got to be people who keep count and remember. Andre Crouch said, I thank God for the mountains and I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he brought me through. For if I'd never had a problem, I wouldn't know how God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. We've talked about getting into history. There, there's, the, uh, there's the first memory aid. We've talked about getting into counting, recounting it to God, recounting it as a lesson to our own souls to remember the wonders and the mercies of God. Number three memory aid, to never forget, is get into passion. I mean by that, get thrilled simply about being chosen. Verses 6 and 7 are, are fascinating to us because in the New Testament, these very verses are lifted out of the Psalms and quoted in Hebrews and saying, this is talking about Jesus. But David is presenting these words personally here. He says, in sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted but you have given me an open ear. So this passage is quoted in Hebrews 10 with an interesting twist, that it's about Jesus. Hebrews 10.5 says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, quoting right out of verse 6, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. This is interesting because in the Psalms it says, You have given me an open ear, in Hebrews, it is rephrased, a body you have prepared for me. 
And apparently what we see in Psalm 40 is some kind of a Hebrew idiom that uh, the book of Hebrews helps us understand. It's talking about the, the body God gave to Jesus as his anointed chosen Messiah, the body that went to the cross for us. Guess what? God has chosen us too. God chose David. God chose Jesus. God chose us. God prepared a body for Jesus. God has prepared a body for us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. What an honor to be chosen of God, to be given bodies to serve him with. God knew me. God drew me. God adopted me. God enriched me. Christian, you belong. Christian, you are in the family. Christian, you are a chosen temple. Christian, you are a billboard for the glory of God. And note, God really doesn't want our stuff. In sacrifice and offering, you've not delighted. God wants me. God wants you. God wants us. God wants our hearts. Get thrilled about being chosen. And then secondly, get thrilled about being employed. Verse 8, I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Lose your job, and then notice how many people call you wanting to come work for them. Sometimes it happens. Usually not. I know unemployed people that have had to work their neck work hard for months and months, sometimes years, to get another job. It can get to you. After so many rejections, you start to have a complex. Nobody wants me. Nobody needs me. <clears throat> I've had several times in my life when I originally needed a job, and I wasn't able to find one. Good news, God's goal is 100% employment. There's never any lack of opportunity for those who are willing to serve him. God never has and never will downsize. He never cuts back hours. He never has seasonal slow times. Get thrilled about being employed by God to do his will, verse 8. Serving God is the most exciting thing in the world. Doing my own will, boring. Doing the will of God, soaring. John 4, 31. Jesus is talking to his disciples. His disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. I've got a couple paragraphs here called the, the Fellowship of the Unashamed. Nobody knows for sure who wrote it, but you're going to love these words. It's the it, it's a words of someone who is proud to be chosen by God and totally sold out to be employed by God. This unknown man writes, I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense, and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, positions, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by presence, learn by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let go, or slow down until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. 
I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops. And when he comes to get his own, he'll have no problems recognizing me. My colors will be clear. Pray with me. Our Father, we cry to you and you answer. You constantly think about us. You make good plans for us. You work big and small wonders in our lives. You forgive our sins. We will never forget the wonder of your heart and your ways in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This psalm has all kinds of problems. It has mud. It has enemies. The author says, I'm poor and needy. And yet it's a happy song. It is a psalm of joy because this is about God as, as the last two lines say, you are my help and my deliverer. In the Lord of the Rings, Sam awakens in Athelion after being rescued from the slopes of ba Mount Doom by the eagles. The ring has been destroyed. Wizard Gandalf speaks to him, well, Master Samwise, how do you feel? Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? Gandalf said, a great shadow has departed. And then Gandalf laughed, and the sound was like music or like water in a parched land. It fell upon Sam's ears like the echo of all the joys he had ever, ne ever known. And Sam's own laughter welled up. And laughing, he sprang from his bed. How do I feel, he cried. Well, I don't know how to say it. I, I feel, I feel, he waved his arms in the air. I feel like spring after winter, sun on the leaves, and like trumpets and harps and all the songs I have ever heard. David would have liked that, friends. The David who said, God pulled me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog. He set my feet on a rock. He made my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. Thanks, friends. God bless you. And before you uh, uh, tune out, uh, Stick around for a minute as we, we run a few rolling announcements to keep you up to speed on things that are coming up.